everyone. We're going to get started. I've got 90 minutes, and uh, I'm going to fill it, so I, I'm, I'm just going to start. <laughs> cool. Wonderful. So, Fast Web Formula 4, my name is Ezra Firestone. Thank you so much for being here, and um, I'm going to go through this slide has nothing to do with e-commerce. Um, I like to put this at the front of my presentations because I, uh, I sent this presentation to a friend to have him you know, kind of vet it and look at it, and he sent it back with this picture at the front as if I wouldn't notice that it was there. <laughs> so now I like to like, show it off. Uh, so one, things that, one of the things that James said uh, at the start b before this session was whether or not you are interested in a physical products business, people who own physical product businesses are fantastic folks to uh, do services for. No matter what type of service you offer, we kind of need it all because everything that's relevant to an information marketing business, it also turns out is relevant to a physical product business in this day and age where uh, faceless businesses are dying and, and businesses of all kinds, even, even ones that are selling physical products need a brand and a personality and things like that. So whether or not you're interested in this business model, um, if you... Uh, consume this information and look at it from the perspective of, of how you can use this for your own business, that, that will be beneficial to you. So we're going to be talking about e-commerce specifically, which is my business model, uh, a bit about Parasite SEO, and then um, visibility, which is traffic, conversion, and then the third piece of the puzzle, which is something that I've learned from James over the past six months that have transformed uh, all of my, all my e-commerce businesses. So a couple uh, big reasons why I prefer a physical product business model or why I like the physical product business model. And the first is that there's no persuasion necessary to sell products, right? People are already looking for those things. You don't need a long sales funnel. They were looking for a salt shaker when they came to your website and they buy that thing when they get there. And all you really have to do is kind of make it look nice. And you can see here that most of our transactions happen day one. 95% of, of the transactions in this store are happening on the first day. Um, uh, um, the range will be between 75 and 100% of your transaction will be on the first day. This is more of an average store here with a 75% first day transaction rate. Another cool thing about physical product businesses is that you have an extremely high value per visitor. So for every visitor who hits one of our sites, we're making between a dollar and five dollars, and that's because they were already looking for those products when they showed up. So uh, they're not coming to consume information. They're not coming to hang out with us. They're coming specifically to buy products. And that's one of the lovely, this, you know, another example, $2.88. So it's just a, um, it's, it's a good model for, uh, for you, you need less traffic because this is why, when I, when I initially got into physical products, it was, okay, I've figured out how to get traffic. I kind of understand how this works. What's the best way I can leverage that traffic? And what I decided on was the best way to leverage the, that, the ability that I had to generate traffic was by retailing actual tangible goods. Um, another cool thing, which kind of goes along with this whole uh, uh, concept we're talking about, is that it, these stores convert really highly because people are coming there to buy stuff. So it's not uncommon to see a 6% conversion rate, and that's not an opt-in, that's a purchase of a product. One, uh, one, between 1% and 2% is more, is more, av is more of an uh, average conversion rate. So uh, one of the things I like to talk about in business is timing. And if you have a chance to check out the Think, Act, Get podcast episode on, on time, um, I think it, you might enjoy it. Uh, so this, uh, my skincare company is called Boom by Cindy Joseph, and it's the main uh, physical product business that I like to use as an example. And the interesting thing about this company is if you look at um, America and Australia and the UK and pretty much any society where, where we are right now on the spectrum of, of the human race, something interesting is happening, and that is that men are valued for their production. Right, so as men, as men age, as they produce more, as they make more money, they get more power in the eyes of society. They get more social power. Women, on the other hand, in most societies, are valued for youth and beauty. And that stems back to 100 years ago when a woman really was more valuable to society in their childbearing years. Well, now that's kind of uh, an outdated model, but what's happening is we have 76 million 
people in the baby boomer generation in the United States, half of which are women, and they're all collectively having the experience of their, their hair graying, their skin wrinkling, and their bodies are aging on the outside faster than they are on the inside, and people are treating them, society is treating them differently as a result, and they don't like it. And so every product out there is anti-age, anti-wrinkle, anti-women, really, if you think about it, and our product is uh, the messaging behind our product, it's a very similar product to some of the other products that are out there. It's all organic, it's edible and all that stuff, but the messaging is different. It's, hey, you know, you are right just the way you are and you don't need to cover yourself up and you should celebrate who you are. And you're, so the messaging is different. So wh why is this, what does that have to do with anything? Well, what it has to do with is that the timing was right for that message. There's a group of people having a collective experience and businesses and products and brands do really well when they're talking to groups of people who are all having one collective experience. And so we hit, we started this a couple years ago, and we, we, it, it's taken off because the messaging was right for that group of people who were having that collective experience. So what does this have to do with e-commerce? Well, timing, we are, we are right now, the people who are starting physical products businesses today 15 years from now, we'll be really happy they did because 8% of total retail sales in, in uh, UK, nor Northern, Northern America, take Canada, are done online right now. When I started, it was more like 4%. So in the past eight years, we've doubled the amount of people who buy products online. And that number is growing by 15% uh, year over year. So what's happening is people are getting more comfortable with purchasing physical products and, and just making online purchases in general. And what's happening is the world is catching on. So in China last year, there's a, a holiday that's the equivalent to uh, Chinese Valentine's Day. And two companies, the Chinese equivalent of Amazon and the Chinese equivalent of eBay, those two companies together did a combined $3 billion in sales in one day, which to give you perspective is three times the total online retail sales done on Black Friday in America. And only 2% of Chinese people, right now we have 8% in America who buy products online, only 2% of total retail sales are done online in China. So the world is catching on. The point here is that if we look at where we are in the life cycle of e-commerce, we're, we're a baby. People like to say the internet is in its infancy. Well, e-commerce is like there, it's, it is the time to be doing this business model. So if you're interested in this business model, if you, if you are interested in providing services to people who have this business model, then um, that's basically what I'm doing is telling you that you should listen to what I have to say. That's not, <laughs> all this is about, <laughs> the whole point of all this, really. All right, so we've got a, I was kind of polling the room um, and we've got a, uh, a spectrum here. We've got some people who are interested in getting started in e-commerce businesses, some people who have e-commerce businesses. I'm gonna give you these slides, but feel free to take pictures of them. Um, so uh, what I did was I broke it up. We've got uh, some information on if you're interested in getting started, how you can go about that. And, and I've put the emphasis of this presentation on if you already have an existing e-commerce business, how can you get more from that business? And the reason I did that is because if you're a service provider, you can take all the stuff that's in this presentation and charge a lot of money for it. So let's talk about the market criteria checklist. So this is a little checklist that I created um, because I've built a lot of these businesses and they've not all worked out. And so I put together a little checklist for myself. Uh, if a market has, if it scores well on this checklist, the way it works is you add up all the points, you know, if you have this part, if you have this part, and down at the bottom there's a, a, a little, you know, you can, if you're, if, you're in the, if you're in the excellent category, you've probably got a winning market. So average order value between $75 and $200. I'm gonna start talking really fast, and you guys can all keep up because it's a very smart room. Average order value between $75 and $200. So this is not average product price, this is average order value, right? Because sometimes people order two products, sometimes products have accessories. Why does your average order value have to be between $75 and $200? Well, you're most likely not making more than 20 to 30% uh, margins on an e-commerce store. So you need to be making about $25 profit per order on the bottom end in order to be able to drive traffic effectively. And as we'll learn later, Google pay-per-click AdWords is the best traffic source for a physical product store. The reason you don't really want to be above two or $300 is because at that point, you need a lot more customer service. People are a lot less likely to pull out their credit cards and just buy something that's four or $500. They want to talk to someone to do that. Gross margin, 20% or more. And this one is 
worth five points. The other one's worth five points. So these are very important. The number of points next to each one of these things is its level of importance. So I will stop talking about the points now, but I just want to bring that back. If you're not making 20% or more on your products, you're going to have a really hard time buying advertising. And if you can't buy advertising for your physical product store, you probably don't want to be in that market. Yes, you can generate traffic in a bunch of other ways that we're going to talk about in a second, but you absolutely want to be able to buy advertising because what's happened is if you look at all of the channels, right? Google Shopping, Price Grabber, The Find, uh, Overstock.com, Amazon, eBay, all of these channels that allow you to retail your products on them have now moved to a paid model. Once they got enough people to adopt, once they had enough people using, like Google Shopping was free forever and it was the most beautiful thing in the whole world. And then in August of 2012, they moved to a paid model. And the reason they did that was because they had enough people using that product that they could, they could now afford to make people pay because we weren't going away. We loved the product. We were invested in the product and now we're willing to pay for it and now they can charge for ads on it. So you want to be able to uh, drive track it. Fragmented market. This one does not really matter, but the, what I mean here is if you take your top five keywords and you search them, if it's the same 10 people who are showing up, that's not really a fragmented market. That means you've got people who are in that market uh, who are players. Lends itself to return customers. This is very important. Like take my gift baskets business. I can sell a gift basket to the same person once every two months because they're buying it for Christmas, they're buying it for holiday, uh, Hanukkah, they're buying it for Easter, for Valentine's Day. It, it, it's very easy to, to have multiple sales, right? Whereas my Halloween business, I make one sale a year does not lend itself to return customers. So that's an important one. Lends itself to multiple item orders. Are people buying just one of your product? Nobody buys just one boom product. They buy our skincare, they buy our, 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 um, our, our whatever that stuff is called. <laughs> <laughs> Moisturizer. <laughs> uh, so you wanna make sure that if, you, if you've got, a, you, that your market lends itself to multiple items. Can you add value to the market? The answer to this is absolutely yes but you just gotta be willing to do it. And this is what will set you apart as, we're talking, as we'll talk about in a second here. But can you add value to your market beyond just listing products for sale? If you're not willing to do that part, when all of you are because you're all owning the race course and that's really what it is, um, yeah, that's just a good one. Products, are, are they difficult to find locally? If someone can find, no, where are you gonna find an Elvis wig or a mullet? You're not gonna find one unless you live in New York City. People in Alabama need to go online to buy that product. So that's a really important one. You don't want to sell commoditized products, as we'll talk about in just a second, but if your product is available locally, you probably don't want to be selling it online. All right, um, seasonal business. I really like seasonal businesses because there's a certain fervor, there's a certain kind of energy and, and, and rabidness that happens when it's Halloween or it's Christmas or it's a gift or it's some level of seasonality to that business. And it's also kind of a fun business model when you have a million dollars in sales in one month and then kind of nothing for the rest of the year. It's just like a, I don't know, I like seasonal businesses and um, I think that they, uh, they're, they're good businesses. Are, if you look at your top keywords in Google Trends, are those, um, uh, are those, if, you know, when you look in Google Trends, you can see the, the countries and the states where those keywords are most highly searched. If your country is not in the top for that, you probably don't want to be selling that product in that country. I mean, it's not worth a whole lot, as you can see, but it is something that we look at is, is this product hot in our specific country? Um, do you have at least 70 SKUs? So what this means is, and, th and this is specifically geared towards a drop ship physical product business model where you are going to a supplier who has a product, you're taking their product catalog, you're building a website, you're putting those products up on that store and you're sending traffic to them. And when someone buys something, they pay you. And so let's just take my, my wig business, for example. I, I get all these wigs for about 15 bucks a piece. I put them on my store for $35, $40. Someone finds them, they buy the wig, they pay me the $40. I then go to the supplier, I say, hey, this person has just bought this thing, here's your $15, please ship it to them. So that's the business model that I'm specifically discussing here. There's also other business models like Boom and some of the other businesses we have where we are either manufacturing or white labeling and you can have much less products there because you're doing more brand building. But the point here is if you're doing a physical product business, you want at least 70 items because you need, you need a certain level of, you need a certain number of products out there because you want to rank for the long tail keywords. You want enough products to buy traffic on. And what we've found is when we have under 70 SKUs, it's really hard to, to, to scale that business, to get it up over seven figures. So you want to have at least 70 SKUs on your store. Is there competition, right? Are there other people buying traffic in that market? 
If there's nobody else buying traffic, you don't want to be in that market because nobody's making money. Is the average weight of your product under 10 pounds? It gets really uh, tough when you're shipping heavy products because you can't, it's harder to offer free shipping. They get damaged quite easily. Now, we still do this. We have a bar stools business. It does quite well, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt. So if you can sell products that are light to ship, you're going to do better. Do your top three keywords have a combined 15,000 exact match searches per month? If you don't have at least 15,000 in your top three, you better have a really long tail because you, you gotta have a certain amount of volume. And now with channels like Amazon and eBay and all that stuff, it's a lot easier to generate traffic for physical products, but you still wanna be able to get Google traffic because Google traffic is really good traffic. And is the target market women? Something interesting, I mean, what I love is that almost half, half of, of us in here are women, it's fantastic. When, when I used to go to these conferences um, six and seven years ago, there was no women. And, and, and that was when e-commerce, e-commerce is making a resurgence. It was very popular eight years ago. And it kind of, in our community, the popularity went down and now it's coming back. But all of the sort of small mom and pop e-commerce businesses have been built predominantly, I'd say in 80-20 by men. So there's an, uh, there's an opportunity for women because there's a dude is not going to do a maternity clothing store. He just doesn't have that you know, uh, he doesn't have that, the ability, he's not going to do that. So you, there's an opportunity for female focused markets. We look for female focused markets because there are less people doing that. And another interesting thing about e-commerce is that if once you get up to one or two million in revenue in a market, now you have some players, but anything under that, there's really not many people who know what they're doing in those markets. It's very easy to break into a six-figure e-commerce store. It's very easy to create one of these things. With everything that you guys know from a traffic generation perspective, you could have six-figure e-commerce businesses fairly easily. It's not super difficult to build one. Once you get over seven figures, then you end up dealing with some people who are doing a little better. But when we, look at, when we just look at all the stores in our markets, there's usually one or two who are doing any kind of sophisticated marketing. So um, it's a good, good business model. All right, let's talk a little bit about how to find markets to enter. This is a, a little dirty diaper trick. One of the things we like to do is we will go and look at the top designers on every platform. If you look at uh, Magento, Shopify, Volusion, Big Commerce, Zencart, ShopSite, any one of these uh, platforms, and you, look, you just do a Google search, uh, Magento designer, Magento developer, Magento web development, you're going to see the people paying for ads are the people who are, can afford to pay for ads within that market, which means they're the top designers on that platform. If you go to their sites and you look at their befores and afters, if someone can afford to pay the top designer to redo their site, they're doing well in that market. So it's a really good um, little way to, to think, and we get a lot of markets that way. Um, other markets are niches of niches, right? We don't do Halloween costumes, we do wigs. We don't do dog supplies, we do dog beds. These little micro niches of bigger niches are what you wanna go into. Hobbies are fantastic. Anything that people are kind of a little bit crazy about, right? People who are into model trains love their model trains. I mean, they love them. And so they're willing to like buy a lot of them and all kinds of things about them and, and relate, you know, they've just, hobbies are fantastic. Weird and embarrassing stuff, right? Nobody is gonna buy uh, nobody wants to go down to the store and buy their manscaping kit, you know, or, or their, you know, fungal cream or whatever. Just stuff that people are embarrassed about, you know, are good products on like breast pumps and things like that. There's a, um, there's a guy called uh, Internet Retailer, which is, if you're interested in, in, in the e-commerce business, that's probably the uh, authority in our community. They, they run a conference called the Internet Retailers Conference. They've got a guide called the Top 500 Guide, which will tell you all of the businesses, all of the categories of, of, um, of, of physical product stores, gifts and flowers and all that stuff, and which businesses are doing better year over year. It's just the best. There's 500. They actually have a second 500 guide now. So they'll give you the top 1,000 e-commerce stores and not from a revenue perspective. So you just get all these weird, interesting markets. It's a fantastic place to find markets. And then the other places, like I buy sites, right, on Flippa, on Biz Buy Sell, on Latonus. We'll go and we'll buy these e-commerce sites that are maybe doing 30 grand a year in profit. You can buy one of those for 50 or 60 grand or 15 grand a year in profit. And the other thing, interesting thing about a physical product business is that it's a very simple business model to understand. It's buy low, sell high. Everyone understands the uh, physical product business model, so they're very easy to sell these assets. There are people out there every day looking to buy these things. So when you build one up, it's, it's quite easy to flip. Now, granted, you need a year's worth of data to prove that this business has been viable for a year, but all of the places that you would go to buy a business, 
you go and you look for markets there because these people are selling businesses that have done well. So that's just a, a, a little bit about if you're interested in getting into physical products, there's some ways to find markets. There's a bit of, of um, information on what to look for as far as market criteria goes. So now what we're going to talk about is what I'm most excited about is how do you get more eyeballs? There's, there's three ways to grow a business, right? Number one, get more visibility. Get more people to know about your product, your service, your business. That's traffic, and there's all kinds of ways to do that. Second is have a higher conversion rate. So for all those people who come to your website or come to, who see your offer, can you get more of them to take you up on it? And uh, along with that goes, can you increase your average order value? So maybe you don't get more people to take you up on your offer, but you increase the value of each sale. That's the second way to grow a business. The third way is to increase repeat business. That's all you got. You got more visibility, you got higher conversion rates, or you got repeat business. Let's talk about how we do this for e-commerce. First thing you gotta know about an e-commerce business is you've got six main templates, or eight here, I guess. You got your home page, your section page, your product detail page, your blog, your checkout pages, your pay-per-click landing pages, your more information pages, and your social profiles. That's all you have with e-commerce. It's pretty simple, and we'll talk about each one of these. Now, one of the things you should know from a traffic perspective, from a visibility perspective, from a physical product store, is that every search query on Google has a unique set of channels. So what does that actually mean? And I'll tell you about the channels to occupy in just a second. Every search has a unique set of channels. So if you look at a search like um, wigs, they're gonna, Google understands that that's a, that's a search for a, a physical product, so they're going to deliver you a set of channels. You're going to see video results. You're going to see um, channels like Amazon and eBay. You're going to see websites. You're going to see blogs. You might see news results. So it's just different classifications of media formats, right? It's, James has owned own the race course. So Google understands that different people prefer to consume media in different formats. Some people like to read. Some people like to listen. Some people like to watch. Some people are looking to... Uh, shop, and so, so they understand from a query perspective what the, the searcher's intention is, and they deliver multiple options for that person. Maybe this searcher who's looking for a physical product wants to read information about that product. Maybe they want to buy that product. So if you understand these channels for each given query, then, and then, you, can, then you can figure out how to occupy more than one space on Google because you can have content that's relevant for each one of those channels. With uh, physical products, here are the channels that we have to occupy from a physical product perspective. We've got search engine optimization, right, which is what I just talked about. Pay-per-click, where we're buying the traffic on Google, on Amazon, on Price Grabber, and all these other engines. We've got comparison shopping engines, like Google Shopping, and uh, The Find, and some of these free ones. We've got email marketing, we've got social media. So how can you take advantage of this for your store? Well, you want to have an image for every one of your products. If you don't own your image, if it's your manufacturer's image, watermark it. Change the size. Interesting thing. The bigger the image is, if everyone has the same image and yours is watermarked and yours is bigger, your image will outrank theirs. I don't know why, but it's working. Um, video for each one of your section pages, your home page, and your top uh, in your best-selling products. And we'll talk about video and how well it sells, but videos are super easy to rank. You guys all know that. No e-commerce businesses out there are ranking videos for their section pages. Every time I come into an e-commerce market and I create a video for my top three keywords, I get a ton of traffic because I'm the only video on that page. You have pay-per-click where we have image ads, text ads, retargeting. That's probably your best channel from a physical product perspective. Amazon ads, if you just use Google, I just did this thing where I, I did a, um, I, I'm launching a course like James mentioned where I, where I kind of Take, go through my whole uh, system for, fit, for dropship businesses. And I did this challenge and I said, hey guys, I'm going to find a market, build a platform, set up an advertising campaign and run traffic to a store and try to make a sale within seven days. And if I can do that, I can prove to you that you can do this business model. Got to day four, I hadn't made any sales. I was a little worried, but we finally we made a bunch of sales ended up working out really well. But the point is that you only need one or two. It's good to have all these different channels, but really with a physical product business, you're probably going to live and die by whether or not you can buy traffic at a profit. Amazon listing for every one of your products. That's the beauty of a physical product store is you have your own asset, but you also have your products on all these other channels. And like I'll show you in a, in a, in a second here, if you look at any query for a physical product, Really above the fold, you're going to see ads, you're going to see Google Shopping, and you might see one or two uh, organic results. Your videos, your images, your website are all below the fold. And then obviously your blog and whatever educational content you have and MP3s and PDFs and that kind of stuff are going to rank in that market too. So here's what, uh, here's what, here's what a, a, an average 
um, query will look like. You can see we've got, we've got our ads, we've got Google Shopping, which is also paid, and then we've got Amazon. And that's, above, that's the fold on my laptop. Now, one of the things I want you to see is that Zappos is running a text ad, and they're also running an image ad. And that's the beauty, is you get to run two ads within that same ad network. So we have image ads for every one of our pro pro uh, products, and also text ads. And image ads are still so cheap. We're getting 50% cheaper clicks on image ads, and we're converting at 50% higher than we are on text ads. So I just wanted to show you that champ that these are the channels that you have to occupy if you're selling physical products. And it's mainly, above the fold, paid opportunities at this point. All right, so that covers the, that covers the, the overview of how you generate visibility for a physical product store. How do we make more sales and increase our average order value? This is, this is the stuff I really like. This is what I'm excited about, is how can we take a store that already exists and get more from it? Well, I've got a whole bunch. I'm going to go through all of that right now. So site-wide conversion boosters. With, with a physical product store, it's a very simple funnel. All you are trying to do is get them through your store. You want to get them from your home page into a section page, over to a product page, and then finally in your shopping cart. And you can see here that 10% of the people who, who make it to our product page actually buy something. And 37% of the people who end up in the shopping cart actually buy something. So if you are not tracking goal flow on a physical product store, you, then you don't know what's going on. You need to be tracking the flow. And you can set this up for any business. What is the flow that you want people to go through? Are you tracking that in your analytics? Because you might make a tweak and find, because it, it multiplies too. If you end up getting 20% of the people to go from the home page to the section page instead of 10%, you've now doubled your business on that one little tweak. So goal flow is a very important concept to understand from an analytics perspective. What is, what is, what is your goal here? Where are you, what are you trying to get people to do? It might just be an opt-in, but from that opt-in perspective, where, what do you want them to do? Set up tracking for that and then monitor those results. This is just another way of showing you that same data that Google um, has in analytics. I like to look at it from traffic type. I like to look at it from source medium and see how well, I'm, how well my goal flow is going from a pay-per-click perspective, from an organic perspective, et cetera. Now, one of the things that we discovered, what, what do you see here on, on this slide? What, what do all of these people have in common? They all have something in common at the top. They've got these Giant, someone's saying it. They've got these giant search boxes at the top of their stores. Why are they doing that? It goes back to uh, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. If you can get commitment and consistency, if you can get someone to take one action, they're more likely to take another action. We discovered this on accident. We used to put our search boxes in the left-hand navigation, top of the left-hand nav navigation, and, we do, and we're tracking site search, right? 2% of the people who visited our stores were searching, and 10% of the revenue from the store was coming from those 2%. So we thought, well, what if we put our search box right up here in the header? This is what happened. You can see it bumped it up to 5% of the people who were visiting that store were searching. Check this out. Whoa, there it is. The second slide is 30% of that store's revenue. So 150,000 out of 600,000 in that time period came from those 5% of visitors. So getting people to take the action of searching on your store. And now what we're testing is having the search bar flow with you. You scroll, that search bar stays with you. And I'll let you know how that one goes. But we want to really encourage that behavior. The other thing is that you, get, you can see what people are searching and if they're searching for products that you don't have. Tra tracking analytics, Google Analytics makes it really easy to track site search and what people are typing into that search box, you would be fascinated to find out some of the weird stuff they're typing into your search box. And you want to know that stuff, right? Because you want to know what your people are looking for. And so we end up like figuring out products that we should add or products that we should remove or weird requests that our customers have that they, they think the search box is the customer support. It's just a fascinating, it's just weird. But it's something worth looking at. All right, header best practices. So th these are some of the... Um, these are some of the top retail sites online. I want to talk to you guys about a couple of things in the header. You want to have, now, Zappos introduced, you see Zappos is the top one there. They introduced this double header model, which has now become standard on e-commerce stores. One of the interesting things about a physical product business is you've got Zappos, Amazon, eBay, um, a couple of these other stores that like 
20% or 30%, I think it's up to 40 now, uh, if, you, if you take those top 10 stores, something like 50%, between 30 and 50%, I don't have the actual statistic, of transactions that are happening online or happening on those stores. So they are training your customers, they are training people what needs to be available, the, the way a store should look. They're like training your customers how the shopping experience should be. So if you can model what these people have, your conversion rates will increase because they're used to this kind of thing. So Zappos introduced this double header where they've got an offer up the top, they've got the navigation links that you're looking for, right? Like your cart, about us, my account, whatever. And then they have their offers. They've got their logo, their search box, their unique selling proposition, their guarantees, and then they've got another level of navigation. So that double header, and now if you look at any big e-commerce site, they all have this. We implemented just the double header model. We saw a double doubling of our conversion rate. Your header is your most important area on your entire website, on any website. Your header is the most important area because nobody scrolls. So what do you have going on in your header? From an e-commerce perspective, you want to think about having trust seals. You want to think about having live chat, all the information people are looking at, your shipping information, your return information, frequently asked questions about us. All the stuff that people are looking for needs to be in that header. It needs to be laid out in a foveal perspective because your eye can only see, look at how Zappos does it. They've got little chunk, little chunk, little chunk. It's not all, it's chunked up. And uh, we'll talk about that in the navigation. So, and I'll give you guys a list. I have a list of the top 100 e-commerce stores that we follow from a testing perspective because we're following what these people are doing to run tests. Oh, they just changed that? Let's see how that works. I'll give you guys that. Site-wide conversion boosters. Obviously, you want to have your favicon, your social buttons. You want to have video, which we'll talk about in a second. Frequently asked questions and educational content is a no-brainer. People have questions about your products. You should answer them because you'll make more sales if you do. Randomly displayed testimonials. And then in your footer, you want to have a trust symbol, some, a, another search, an opt-in, a security symbol, some guarantees, and then whatever links you want to have. Um, Let's talk about some other site-wide conversion boosters. Incentivize time constraints. There's a company called Exclusive Concepts. They run a website called conversionsondemand.com. If you have an agency that offers services to physical product businesses, go to conversionsondemand.com, sign up for their services, and start offering those to your customers and charging double or triple. I mean, it's incredible what their tools can do. Incentivize time constraints. What this will do is basically, so you can set it for a certain amount of time someone's been on your store, for uh, if they visited X number of pages, it'll pop up this little thing that you see down here in their corner where it says, hey, check out within, the, within X number of minutes and you'll get this percentage off. So you're incentivizing them to check out with a time constraint and it is incredible how well that works. A daily deal bar. We all know what daily deal bars are. Incentivized opt-ins, right? Opt in here and save 15% and then peel away specials like you see on Tim's boots here. So conversions on demand will do all of these things for you. And what happens when you, when you add these things up is your conversions, it compounds. So you add the site-wide conversion boosters that I'm talking about now. We'll talk about home page, product page, section page, and the rest of these things. You add them all together and you've now taken a store that was converting at 0.5 and you've moved it up to 3%. You've taken a store that was doing $25,000 uh, a year in profit and bumped it to $150,000 a year in profit. So conversion is exciting because it doesn't require you to have any more traffic. It just requires, it's just, what can you do with that traffic that already exists to get more from it? And this is just tracking in the analytics and you can see people, these are just, uh, you know, we do event tracking so we can see how many people use the, um, coupon, how many people clicked on the uh, daily deal bar and bought, how many people searched and bought, whatever, et cetera. Um, so you want to be tracking the events in your store. And if you need an analytics person who can set up event tracking, I have a guy for you. You can email me. His name is Michael. I don't have his email address offhand, but uh, he, I don't, I don't, event tracking is beyond me from an analytics perspective. I like analytics and I'm a nerd and I like play with it, but event tracking is a little bit more complicated. So you want someone who can actually do that for you. It's not very expensive. All right. Live chat. You will get a 15% boost in your conversion rates on any, any website that you offer live chat. We see sometimes 25 and 30% conversion rate increases. That's a, that's a big increase of <laughs> conversion rate when we're willing to do live chat. Now, I like livechat.com and Olark because they're really simple and easy to use. And one of the things that we've been testing is this popping up a live chat after a minute. If they've been on our site for a minute, we say, hey, would you be interested in talking to us? Look who's, look who's doing it. Crate and Barrel. By the way, if you want to see the best e-commerce store out there, 
You want to see the guys who are running split test? I follow Crate and Barrel on a weekly basis, but these guys are always changing what they're doing. They're always running split tests. They have one of the, the, the highest converting, highest trafficked, and just most amazing e-commerce stores out there. You should follow Crate and Barrel if you're interested in, in e-commerce because they do it really well. But look, everyone's doing it. Zappos is doing it. The Disney store, man, these guys do really well, the Disney store. Um, and they have the double header too if you, if you take a look at them. Uh, if Everyone's popping out a live chat. People now expect to be able to talk to someone about the products. So if you offer that ability, if you offer the, the, the customers who are on your store the ability to actually engage with a real person, you will see a lot more sales. The other thing is you can track how many people engage with live chat, how much money came from live chat. This is, again, uh, uh, event tracking. All right, the most ignored... <laughs> those are funny pictures. The most ignored... Um, pages on an entire website or your more information pages about us, privacy policy, security, returns, shipping, all these pages that people actually visit. Not a huge percentage of your, of your customers visit your more information pages, but the one who, ones who do are going there because they want that information. And so if you take the time to actually create a video that walks people through all of that content, this, these are the, this is the easiest place to see a conversion rate increase on an e-commerce store because nobody takes the time to do it. Of course, you still want to have it all in text, but if you create a video, you can see shipping information, customer. We always have, we put a page front and center on every one of our stores and it takes up like half the navigation and it says, why buy from us? And then we create a video talking about all the reasons that we're awesome and that they should buy from us. And it really works because people want to know why should they buy from you? Uh, as opposed to someone else. So if you just tell them, then they're like, oh, sweet, all right. That, and they do it. So it's, it's something, you know, you guys could think about this. It, it relates to any business. Why use our services company? Why use our, like, you just give them the reasons why they should use you. All right. I won't run through all these stats here, but basically what this is saying is that for selling physical products, there is nothing better than video. Think about any big physical product, product launch, Apple, uh, Amazon Kindle, every, any one of these people, every single one of them has a video associated with that big physical product launch. When we add videos, and the video doesn't have to be special. It can just be like, here's the product, and this is what it looks like, and here's a little bit about it. Like, it doesn't have to be a special video. Any video on an e-commerce store page will you can see up to a 64% increase in your conversion rate of that product. So all of your best sellers, you should put a video on. Video just sells so well. We all know that. We put videos on our homepage, on our product page, on our shopping cart. We put a video on our shopping cart page like, hey, don't worry. Everything's all secure. We're still with you. You know, like, we, you know, like you just tell them. Just keep them. You got to reassure people that, you're, that everything's cool all along the way. It's still cool, man. Uh, more info pages. Post action requests. This is what I learned from James. After they take an action... We, th we think, we acknowledge that they just did that, right? People like to be acknowledged. Another episode worth listening to, the acknowledgement episode. How many tag listeners in here? Oh, that's sweet. Awesome. So you guys probably are, already heard that. But um, if someone takes an action that you've asked them to take, forget about conversion for a second. It's just really nice to say thanks. They just did what you wanted. And the least you can do is thank them for it. And then you can ask them to do something else. And they're much more likely to do the next thing you ask them if you've just acknowledged them and thanked them for doing the thing that you just asked them to do that they just did. So how is this practical? Well, one of the things we started doing was after someone buys, we say, thanks so much. Would you tell us why you bought, what you think we could improve on? Like we give them a survey and, and that strategy is working really well for us. Um, we also do video on our education pages. And you can see how many people watch those post-action videos. This is 93% engagement rate on these post-action videos. We're seeing between an 80% and a 95% engagement rate on. And, and the key here is, look, you want to engage with your market. You want FaceTime with your community. And that's the thing that we weren't doing beforehand. We were just offering products for sale. We were not building relationships with our customers. And when we started doing that, a couple things happened. We started making a lot more sales and we started having a lot more valuable assets when we sell these things now, we're getting higher multiples because we have an engaged community around that store, which I think is the brilliance of Own the Race Course. So unique selling propositions and offers. You want to have these anywhere you know, on, your, on your header and your footer, on your pages. Like what differentiates you? 
Why should they be buying from you? Do you have free shipping? Do you offer better, ed better education on the products? Do you put together special packages and bundles? Do you have excellent customer services like, and I got the why buy from us page, like what is it about you and your business that is unique? And if you're not using, if you don't have attention on unique selling propositions uh, and you're not actively looking for how to communicate those to your customer base, then you're, you're missing out from a conversion perspective. Because the goal with a business, right? I mean, look, there's other people who sell skincare. There's other people who sell bar stools. There's other people who have podcasts. Why engage with me? That's the question that I want to answer for you. I want, you're not going to ask me. You're not going to say, hey, man, why should I, you know, because that's like, people don't do that. But I'm going to proactively put that out there and tell you why I think what I have to offer is the best thing. And if you don't think what you have to offer is the best thing, stop selling it, frankly. Like, if you don't feel good about what you're selling, then don't sell it because you're not going to be successful with it. All right. Homepage conversion boosters. Rich home pages win. What do these pages have in common? They're all super rich. Now you can't even see, they keep scrolling down. They've all got a home page banner and a rotator. They've got, we'll talk about them in a second, but I just want to talk about how rich home pages win. What do you, half of your traffic will end up on your home page on a physical product store. Even if they don't enter through the home page, half of traffic ends up there. They go there they, because they go to the home page to look for answers to all their questions because they, they're being taught by these bigger companies. Again, this is my theory on this, that the home page is where they go to get answers to their questions. So you want to have rich home pages with videos, with testimonials, with frequently asked questions. You just long form sales letter, but not really because it's chunked up into different, different sections. But essentially, it's a really long page with everything they could possibly want to know about your store. You take the average e-commerce uh, home page, which just has like a banner and some products, and you turn it into a rich, engaging home page with testimonials and frequently asked questions and shipping information and return information and a hello video from the owner and someone walking out. You know, they have these little walkout things where you walk out on things. You'll, you'll, you'll see a really big boost in conversion rate, up to 20% boost by having a rich home page because everyone goes to your home page. So couple elements of the homepage, a main banner plus category kickers, right? So uh, a main banner for some image of your store, uh, for the main most popular, um, the main most popular section on your store, and then a couple categories. Now, sometimes you'll want to test this against just listing products. Sometimes we'll have a store where we kill the, the, the banner and, and the rotator and all that stuff, and we just list products, and that performs better. So it's worth testing, but everyone is doing this. Everyone has this banner, rotator, and, and category kickers, so it's worth considering. Next thing is you want tabbed featured products based on category. So notice what all of these people have. They've got featured products, best-selling products, in tabs based on category. Now, you go into Google Analytics, you click in-page analytics, and you can see your most popular categories, right? You can see which categories on your store and your navigation structure are the most popular. If you're not looking at in-page analytics, you if you're running Google Analytics on your site, you have the ability to look at this, where people are clicking, what they're doing, and then you can rearrange your page so that the most popular ones are front and center. And the other thing you can do if you're tracking e-commerce is you can see which of those categories is bringing you the highest per page page visit value, and you want to put those front and center. So the way that you set these things up is not just at random. You set them up by looking at what's the most popular and what's bringing you the most money. And every platform out there makes it really easy to track e-commerce conversion because they understand that you need these statistics as an e-commerce business owner. So you want to have um, tabbed featured products based on category. All right, testimonials, hello from the owner, frequently asked questions, all that stuff I was just talking about. These are just examples of the, <laughs> and I just, I really like to show you my face for some reason. Um, these are just examples of that. Now, if we look at some of the bigger stores, Disney Store, Foot Locker, uh, Diapers.com, another Foot Locker for some reason, all of these people are, are doing this same thing, right? All of these big stores seem to understand these concepts, and so you want to take advantage of them too. Um, section page and product page conversion boosters. How many items across on your section page? Standard e-commerce is three. We found that four or more items listed across converts better. Do you have the price, the sale price, the you save dollar amount, and the you save percentage, as well as the star rating listed under that product on the section page? Remember what a section page is. Let's say you have cheese gift baskets. That's a section that has a bunch of products on it. So on that section page, what can you do 
not to sell more products, but to get people to click into a product because the goal is to get someone from your section page to your product page. Do you have a quick view? Quick view is a new feature. It used to be that when you wanted to look at a product, you had to actually click into that product. And if you wanted to go back to the section page, you actually had to go back. Now you can pop up this little quick view button that allows someone to quickly view that product. And if they're not interested, X out of it and they're still on that section page. So forget pagination. Some people, if you've got 100 products, list those 100 products. Nobody goes to the second and third page. So all those products that you have that are paginated, Nobody's looking at them. So you don't want to paginate your pages. And the goal here is to get people to the product page. These little things are what we've found increase that goal. Our goal on the section page is to get people to our product page. And we've found that when we have more items across rather than less, when we have uh, all those things listed under the product, when we have quick view, we increase that goal. All right, this is your most important page on your e-commerce store. The goal, if you can, if you can lift your add to cart ratio five, 10%, you have a significantly, you've significantly increased the value of that store. This is the most important page on your store. You want to get people from the product page in the shopping cart. So get rid of your left nav. You don't want people navigating on your product page. You just want them to look at the products. Any one of these big stores doesn't have a left nav. Tab it up. Instead of listing all your content down uh, the page, have little tabs, little digestible tabs of information. The way Zappos does it, they've got it on the left with those little tabs. The way that uh, Buy Costumes does it, they've got the little tabs right under the product. That's how we do it too. You obviously need social buttons, you need Zoom, you need reviews, and you need to have your Add to Cart button above the fold. I cannot tell you how many e-commerce stores have their Add to Cart button below the fold. It's incredible. It does not work. Are you doing cross-selling? 60% of the people will buy a wig cap with that wig. Have a look at this giant duck. You can see the cross sell is a, is a cowboy hat. If you're buying a giant duck, you obviously want a cowboy hat, right? I mean, come on. I would want a cowboy hat with my duck too. So you want to have cross sells because people, people buy these things. They, they take you up on these cross sells. And uh, the classic, the guy who sells air, right? He sells download insurance. He's selling downloadable products. And for an extra $30, you can have insurance on that download which means you can, I guess, read. I don't know what it means, re-download it. But the point is, he's got a cross-sell and it works. So can you have a cross-sell? You need to have a cross-sell because people will take you up on it. So find something that's relevant. Q&A, user submitted pictures and videos. Okay, Q&A. So you have a little tab that says Q&A. Someone can type a question, you answer it. It sits there on that product page for everyone who's coming to buy that product to see. All their questions are answered right there on that page. User submitted pictures. People who buy giant ducks like to take pictures of themselves with their cowboy hat and their duck, you know. They like to take pictures of themselves doing that stuff and then they will share it with you and then that's social proof. So you wanna have the ability for people to upload. Even if it's gift, doesn't matter. People will take pictures. Anything that someone buys, they will likely take a picture of and send it back to you if you give them that opportunity because people like to take pictures of their stuff. I don't know, whatever it is in our society, but it, it's useful to you. You might also like, look down the right-hand side of that image, other products that are relevant. Bundles, right? What else can, what can you bundle together with the product? Features and benefits. People mess this up with e-commerce for some reason. They only ever list the features. This thing has, you know, uh, it's stainless steel, it's swivel, it's this and that. But what is the benefit? The benefit is you're gonna roll into that party with a giant duck, you know? <laughs> That's the benefit. You're gonna be remembered forever for your giant duck costume. Like, what is the benefit to the user, of, uh, to the customer of buying that product? It's not that the giant duck is inflatable plastic. It's what's the experience in it for them. So if you're rewriting product descriptions, you'd be surprised. It's copy. People underestimate sales copy. It works. You have better sales copy. Shrammy, you should read. I read his stuff because I, I'm interested in the way he writes copy because it's so effective. So um, copy works, and, and you should include uh, benefits, not just features. You want to guarantee, okay, have a look at these images, right? Uh, what's the goal on this page? The goal is to get people to click the Add to Cart button. Nobody has picked up on this yet. This is our own internal split test, and as I get more, like GoDaddy for, anyways, I'll tell you about that story later, but as I get more exposure, I will, I, I, I assume that I'll see some people pick, some bigger stores picking up on these split tests, but your goal is to get people to click the Add to Cart button. What we, we did was we put these little images under our Add to Cart button that said, hey, you know, we got the best price or we've got free shipping, reminded them of why they should shop with us, and we saw an immediate 15% boost in the number of people who clicked Add to Cart. So that one is, you should, that one's a no-brainer. Anywhere that you have an Add to Cart button, on any website, put your unique selling propositions in image format 
right underneath it, and you will see a significant increase in the number of people who click that button because you've already given them all that information. They already know all that stuff, and you're just reminding them of it again. And that's the name of the game. Tell people stuff, and then tell them again in a different format, right? You told it through them in a video, and now there's an image reaffirming that message. And that is how you, that's how you get people to take actions, is you consistently deliver the same message because people wanna know that you're consistent. They wanna know that you actually do have uh, free shipping or whatever it is. And so, and this, this, goes, this is, goes back into persuasion and manipulation, and you could use this for good or bad, but the point is, what we want to understand as marketers is how do we get people to take the actions that we want to take? And we want to use this for good because everyone in here has good products and sells good services, but the way that you get people to take actions is by being consistent in your messaging to those people and giving them that message in different media formats, in image and video and text. And so this little, uh, now I'm going into the psychology of why this works, but it just plain works, and so you should do it, and you guys all have add to cart buttons, so it works. All right, recently viewed items, multiple quality images, right? You wanna have multiple images of your product that people can see, you want a little scroll bar, a little image carousel. You wanna have a video tab. On every one of our uh, product pages, we put two tabs, two extra tabs. One of them said shipping information, and one of them said frequently asked questions. And we put videos in those tabs on every product page, the same video on every one, because what was happening is people were leaving our product pages and going and looking for the shipping information. And then they weren't coming back because they got busy and someone brought them a hamburger. I don't know. They were just leaving and they weren't coming back. And now with, we have these little videos in there that answer those questions and keep them on that page. So an interesting split test for an informational-based website might be to have little tabbed information boxes under the add to cart that answer all their questions. That would be worth testing. But anyways, point is, those videos that you created for your more information pages, you repurpose them on your product page and you put them into tabs on your product page. So your product page is your most important page on um, a physical product store. Um, features and benefits box, you can't see this here, but right under our product image, we've got a, a box that's like, that again restates all of our unique selling propositions. So that whole product page is all about why we're awesome and then it also has information about the product. But the, like, if you wanna get people to buy from you, they've gotta trust you, and so you've gotta continually communicate why they should buy from you. Um, and here's some examples. Everything that I just mentioned is, is happening on these product pages, and you can see them. So Zappos is a really good one to watch, because they do ebags.com, it's a great one to watch. Here's a template that I had created. So I spent a million dollars on Google AdWords. <laughs> Uh, testing, e doing e-commerce conversion testing. And this is, uh, was, is one iteration of the template. I've now changed it a bunch since then, but this is everything I just told you about, right? Image carousel, click to enlarge, social buttons, images under the add to cart, tabbed information boxes, you save percentage, uh, all the stuff that I was just telling you about, reviews. Um, it's, a re it's really good. And also, yeah, so do all that stuff. Shopping cart. <laughs> um, Here's something interesting that happens with shopping carts is people for some reason send, you click add to cart and now you're taken to a page that looks nothing like your website at all. And that is a conversion killer. Congruency across your shopping cart will double your conversion rate. And thankfully, the newer platforms like big commerce and stuff like that are building this in, but it wasn't the case for us years ago with ShopSite and Magento and, and, and Yahoo. Progress bars work fantastic. A shipping calculator so someone can calculate their shipping on their shopping cart. A proceed button at the top and the bottom. You have your proceed button, you have your product, the information about that product, and you've got another proceed button. Everyone started doing this all of a sudden. I think they picked that one up for me because nobody was doing that. And I just want to think that. But everyone, everyone, other people have, you know, the whole hundred, you guys know about the hundred monkeys? So this is what happened with the hundredth monkey. They were doing this test, and monkeys on one side of the world had figured out that dipping their potatoes in, in salt water made them taste better. Once the hundredth monkey had done that on this part of the world, monkeys on the other side of the world started doing the same thing. So it's the hundredth monkey rule, which is, uh, proves, if you want to use that word, the um, universal consciousness. So... This is happening with us for e-commerce, right? I'll run a split test that works really well for me, and a week later, these guys are doing it. So it's just, I don't know. People who are paying attention to the same thing 
tend to pick up on the same ideas at the same time, and it's a phenomenon that sort of keeps happening. Um, you want to have your image, your price. Some people don't put their product images on the shopping cart. You want to show the people what they're about to buy. You need to have that on there. It'll, it'll give you a nice bump and conversion. A phone number, and I should have mentioned that. You want a phone number in your header. Uh, guarantee. And what we noticed was that when we replaced our left navigation on the checkout page with a unique selling proposition that, has, that is nowhere else on, on the website. So it was a uniqueness guarantee, a new statement. So something that's new, a statement that you've not yet made in image format in your, ch in your checkout gives you like a 6% boost. I don't know why it works so well. Perhaps you, I don't know why it works so well, but a new statement and image proof, image benefits and unique selling propositions in the place of a left navigation on an e-commerce uh, checkout. Um, and then here's an example of Crate and Barrel with the double proceed button. Um, and then here's their checkout. And we can see that was the shopping cart page. Now we're at the checkout, right? Because they click Add to Cart. They're taken to a page that says this is your product, you know, all this stuff. So that's their shopping cart. And then they move into the checkout. A couple things for the checkout. You want multiple payment options. Amazon, um, PayPal, and credit cards. Those are the three most important ones to have. 40% of your buyers are signed into Amazon and they can just one click check out. So you want to be using Amazon as a payment option. You want to be using credit cards. You want to be using PayPal. Those are the only three you need. Forget about Google shopping or Google um, checkout or any of those other ones. Uh, single page, meaning they can complete all their details on that one page. We all know about that. Congruency, obviously, from website to cart to checkout. Uh, you want to continue shopping button so that they can continue shopping if they want. And a coupon field. If you're offering coupons, you should be offering coupons because people use them. But if you're not offering coupons, don't have a coupon field. I want to tell you how many people have a coupon field on their cart and they're not offering coupons. And then people go and they go to Google and they start looking for a coupon for that store and they abandon the checkout. All right, additional conversion boosters. Shopping cart abandonment. 25% of your sales, oh my God, 25% of the people who abandon your shopping cart, which will be 80%, by the way, a lot. Eight out of 10 people go into your shopping cart, leave, but 25% of those can be recovered with an abandoned cart email. And there's a bunch of, there's a, a next track, and a million services that do this for you now. Um, the way that we're doing it is we actually wrote a custom module that scrapes the image that they've added to their shopping cart and their email address because they fill out all that email, they fill out all this information, and the value of the cart. So then they get an email five minutes later that says, hey, I, or I don't know, half hour later, whatever it is, I see that you tried to buy this product for this amount, and here's a picture of it, and based on the value of their cart, we give them a coupon. So if they were at $100 in their cart, we'll give them a 10% coupon. If they have $400 in their cart, we'll give them a 15% coupon. So you send people an email, and it shows them exactly what they were about to buy, and that is easy to do now with uh, these platforms because it's all dynamic in the checkout, and you can get people to write that custom script for you, and it works really, really well. But even if you're not doing that, you'll still see about a 20% boost just by following people up. And I've got a, um, I've got a, uh, a friend of mine, Eric Shannon, who uh, is a bril he did, he's brilliant at email marketing for e-commerce. And we did a presentation together on the topic that um, I can put on the uh, Fast Web Formula uh, bio page that James made. Uh, social selling, after someone buys something, incentivizing them to share it. Hey, share this on Facebook, Twitter, and Google, and you'll get 15% off your next purchase. You get free shipping on this purchase. Curebit.com or shop socially.com, curebit.com or shopsocially.com. Thank you videos and surveys, we talked about that. Package inserts, well, even if you're drop shipping, you can send postcards to your drop shipper and say, put one of these in each package. The package insert says, here's a coupon for your next order, here's where you go to join our blog, which we'll talk about in a second, here's uh, a coupon for your friend. It, you just, you wanna give, you wanna have some level of personalization and they work really well. And then you wanna follow up with them a week later or after they've received their product and request a review, send them a link directly to the place. Not, you don't just follow up and say, hey, will you leave us a review, which is what most people do. You follow up with an email that says, hey, will you leave us a review? Here's the link to the product you bought. You can go do that here. Um, you want to see some cool apps, some cool, some cool third-party apps, go to bigcommerce.com forward slash apps. All right, how do we increase repeats? Uh, build, engage the community and build lifelong fans. This is the third piece of the puzzle. This is what most businesses are not paying attention to. Everyone understands traffic. Everyone understands conversion. Nobody's paying attention to how do we build a community and get these people to come back and shop with us again. Well, 
You do it through on the race course. You do it through talking to your community about the problems and conversations that are relevant to their lives. We're not talking to our boom customers about skincare. We're talking to them about menopause. We're talking to them about gray hair. We're talking to them about all these topics that are relevant to that particular community of people. It does not matter what your products are. What matters is who is the community of people who are buying your products. If you're selling breast pumps, your community of people are, are mothers. And now you have all kinds of stuff to talk to them about. So own the race course. If you guys are, have tr trouble thinking about what content to create, here's what people want. They don't want, I mean, look, it's great when you have content rich information, but what's even more appealing is when you do a video that expresses your viewpoints on something that's relevant to the community. People wanna to get to know you. They wanna know what you think about this. All of the cycling uh, e-commerce websites, when Lance Armstrong was doping, they were all creating videos and talking about that scandal and what they thought about that scandal. Thank you. And because that was what's relevant to their community at the time. So we do this, we st I started doing this, I was already doing a video blog on my stores, but I was only talking about features. I was making the mistake that people make in their product descriptions. I was only talking about this is the product and this is blah, blah, blah. I was not engaging my community with anything other than here's information about products you can buy. I met Shrammels, I mean, I knew Shrammels, but I, I started watching what he was doing and it was different than what most people do. And I thought, I could use that. This could be relevant for my stores. Every physical product store I have right now has an OTR style blog. And you know what we're talking about? Not really the products. And this is what happens. Okay, another thing that I should mention, we do run Facebook ads to every one of our product, every one of our videos each week. We actually upload that video to Facebook because again, our goal is not to get people back to the site here. Our goal is just to engage with our community and get them, get FaceTime with them. So we run our Facebook ads, whatever. We do a promoted post. Um, I'm talking to Victoria and the Silver Circle group. We're doing, you know, we're scraping lists and we're doing, um, uh, custom audiences and similar audience. We're doing all the cool Facebook stuff that if you want to know about, Victoria is the gal to talk to. Raise your hand. She's amazing. I'll tell you, if you guys aren't harnessing the power of Facebook ads, you should. It's a, if you want to build a community of people, you want to build a fan base that is engaged with you, go talk to Victoria at the break because look at this stuff. We're generating thousands of clicks for hundreds of dollars. That just doesn't happen anymore. It's happening now. I feel like sometimes, I can't sleep at night sometimes because I'm so excited, I swear to you, because I'm so excited about what's happening on Facebook. Anybody who has a message that they want to get out can get, okay, I started a, 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 a pro-gay marriage fan page because I was curious what will happen if I, you know, gay marriage was this big thing in the States and they're legalizing it and they're not legalizing it. There's all this stuff. It doesn't matter where you stand on the spectrum of either your pro-gay marriage or your anti-gay marriage. What mattered was that the whole country was in a frenzy about this topic. So I thought, what if I just create a Facebook page and run some ads? And the other thing about, about Facebook ads is there's nobody running ads. Like our Waldorf, we have a, a wooden toys uh, e-commerce store. There's nobody who's running ads to people who are interested in that stuff. So we're getting even cheaper clicks. And so anyways, we built up this fan page, like 15,000 people with like $100, $150 in ad spend. Point here is that it's super cheap to get thousands of views for each one of your videos by setting up a promoted post and up, actually uploading that video to Facebook so you're not driving people off of Facebook. Uh, it just works so well and you can start with such a low budget. We're now spending close to $1,000 a day on Facebook because interestingly enough, we've, this, we've figured out that we can actually <laughs> also, while we're engaging with people, do product placements, all kinds of stuff. But point is that it's such a fantastic medium. You should use it. You can see here, we, we use, this is, these are actually our video blogs. These are not from our Facebook ads, but uh, these videos are getting really high engagement rates. These are just Wistia stats. Now, here's what happens. This was not the case for our stores beforehand. Look at the percentage of revenue that's coming from someone who visited our site in the last 30 days. 60% of our sales are from people who visited our site sometime in, in the previous 30 days, which means that this OTR building a relationship with your community, talking to them about their lives and what they're up to and telling them what you think about it actually makes you a lot of money, which makes sense because people feel better taken care of and they're more willing to buy from you if you're actually paying attention to them. And the other thing, obviously, you want to look at where your best states are and run ads in those states and all that kind of stuff. All right, let me just see how many slides I got here. All right, so I did a... Um, 
I did a, uh, I tripled the value of an e-commerce store. I ripped, the, I just went through them and I said, here's all the things that you need to do. And they did all that stuff and they, they doubled their conversion rate and they tripled their, they doubled the, the, the amount of money they were making and they tripled the valuation of the store. So here's what we did. I'm just going to read these off because you guys all, you guys are, you guys all understand this stuff. If you don't, I'll, you can come talk to me on a break. But we fin fixed the canonical error that they were having. They, were, they, had, a, um, they had a canonicalization error. We, we put a site map in there. Um, they only had 655 URLs in, uh, submitted in their site map, but they had 3,000 indexed. We fixed all their duplicate meta descriptions and duplicate title tags. They had image folders ranking with title, the same titles as their product pages. Uh, we fixed all their title tags that were stuffed with keywords. We got rid of their uh, keyword stuffed meta descriptions. We added Google authorship to their, their store. We added um, uh, uh, dynamic navigation. We got them image rights to all their images. So that's just from an SEO perspective. Um, we took all their section pages. They had keywords that were ranking on pages three and six and from pages three to six in Google. We got those up to the first page by running a little SEO to them. We took all their proven converters from Google AdWords, all the keywords that were making money in Google AdWords, and we set up SEO campaigns for them because those are already Prove, this is what you do with a physical product business. You start with Google AdWords, you find what keywords are making you the most money, most profit, doesn't matter which ones are making you the most sales, and then you do SEO for those because they've proven profit. We, we did SEO for those keywords. We did a YouTube video for every one of their products and their major keywords. We put all their images on Pinterest, one for each product. We uploaded all their products to Amazon. We did an OTR style blog with universal syndication. Um, and if you go e-commerce, product performance, unique transaction, you can see which products are generating the most transactions on your store and you can boost those up. Uh, we got rid of all their losers in pay-per-click. We did geo-targeted campaigns because they were running traffic across the whole United States, but they were only converting in the big cities. Um, and that's how you get, there's a little navigation query and, and analytics for how you get there. We shut down Canada and all the companies that weren't converting. We shut off mobile because it wasn't converting for them. We did pay-per-click landing pages for each one of their top keywords and we set up ad tests. We did day parting because they were losing money at certain times of the day. We did product, um, we bumped up their product-specific advertising campaigns because those were what were working best for them. We, uh, they had sections. They were sending pro traffic to the wrong page. We, we created um, PLAs, product image listings, product listing ads for them. Um, and we did, uh, obviously, ad testing and keyword testing. And we bought traffic uh, on other brands. We bought PPC traffic on the other brands that were relevant to them. And they were not doing any advertising for specific products. So we set up an ad for every one of their products. Um, we, we set up an email marketing campaign. They'd never been emailing their clients. We did, um, obviously, lead capture with a lead magnet. We did a weekly blog like I was telling you about. Uh, we put a package insert in their products for follow-up. We did... Um, uh, follow-up campaigns for all their old customers and after 30 days for each new customer. We did a postcard to all their past customers. We created a jingle and we did a welcome video. And all that stuff, and there's a lot of stuff, but it's actually not that hard to do. Uh, if you look, here's the thing. If you understand, this is a structure, right? If you understand the structure of what needs to happen, like it's why artists who work on, on Canvas are, can be so brilliant because they have this structure to play with. If you get the structure, which is what you guys are getting here, you can then do whatever you want within that structure and be creative and make things happen. So do all that stuff that I just listed there and I'll give you these slides and you'll be able to take a store. Here's the other thing, e-commerce businesses that are doing like a million bucks, you can take an e-commerce store that's doing a million dollars and make it a $2 million store if you understand how to, add, how to um, optimize their AdWords campaign, stuff like that. And in that challenge video, in these, the eight day challenge I just did for the product launch, I do an AdWords campaign where I, I spend an hour saying this is how you set up an AdWords campaign. If you're interested in AdWords for physical products, it'd be, in, it'd be good to watch. Uh, Pinterest, I just wanna talk to you guys about how to rank Pinterest real quick. And again, how to understand the structure of a Pinterest board. You've got your profile, which is your main keywords, like the homepage of your site. You've got your boards and you've got your individual pins. Here's a list, each one of those will rank for you. Individual pin would be your long tail keyword, your product specific keyword. Uh, another thing that you have from a reputation management perspective is uh, pinterest.com forward slash source forward slash domain.com. That's Pinterest's 
page for your website where every pin from your site that's ever existed will be on that page, and you can rank that if you do rep management. If you're interested in reputation management, if you offer reputation management, that's one of the services that I still offer from an SEO perspective, and we charge five and $10,000 a month for reputation management. I have a free video on my blog where I take you through how I do those campaigns. It's really um, a fantastic service to offer people because people with big companies need that service. They need their reputations managed, and it's not hard to do using OTL, OTR-style syndication and a couple tricks like this. Um, the Pinterest board is your section level keywords. Is again, physical products have home page, section page, and product page, right? So your product page is your individual pin, your section page, and an example of that would be gift baskets, and then chocolate gift baskets would be a section, and then salmon gift basket would be a individual product. Now here's something interesting, guys. One of the ways that we do so well with physical product stores is Nobody takes the time to match all of their products to long tail keywords. So if you take uh, any one of the gift basket stores out there, they've got all these products that are named all these weird things like Jumpin' Jolly Gift Basket, all these weird names, but it might have smoked salmon in it. And if you go look at the keywords, you'll see that someone's searching for smoked salmon gift basket. So we take this product that's not actually named smoked salmon gift basket and we rename it for that query. So now we have our homepage that's optimized after keywords. Our sections were obviously created based on keywords, cheese gift baskets, wine gift baskets, chocolate gift baskets, uh, all that kind of stuff. And now each one of our products is relevant to a keyword. Here's what happens. When you're running, um, when you're running product listing ads on Google, in Google Shopping, there's nobody else who has products that are optimized after keywords. So when someone types in smoked salmon gift basket, you're the only one that shows up and you get like a six cent click and you're making a whole bunch of money off of product listing ads because you're the only person who took the time to optimize your 500 SKUs after, after a keyword that was relevant to that product. Really cool little trick that works quite well. Um, and then obviously for Pinterest, we've got the URL for your profile, which would be your actual main keyword. So Waldorf toys or pool cues, only one person, it's just like Amazon, uh, only one person can have that keyword on Pinterest, so you should get it for whatever your uh, query is. Um, that's what I got. I'll take questions. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a question, you can come up to the microphone. <laughs> and then we, we're going to have someone come and film it, right? What's that? It was very fast. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I wanted to make sure I got through it all, you know. You guys are, you can all, I mean, you'll have the slides, but you're a very high caliber. We, we're, we're ready. Hi, Ezra. Uh, from uh, your e-commerce store, the Boom by Cindy jo Joseph, yep. Yep. is she a celebrity or is it, did you team up with someone? Did you have a profile before the store? So, Cindy I got lucky with. So I, I, you, you, you listen to Tag, you know my background. I grew up on this hippie commune and... Cindy would come and take these courses that my parents offered. And when I wanted to move to New York as a kid, I called her up and said, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna go to college. I'd like to move to New York. What do you think about letting me move in with you? Interesting thing about Cindy is she was a makeup artist for 27 years. And the day that she cut off um, the last of her, of her dyed hair and let her hair fully go silver, she was approached on the street at 49 years old. Uh, it said, hey, someone said, hey, can we take a picture of you for a potential advertising campaign. She thought someone was just messing with her. She let him do it. She ended up booking a nationwide Dolce & Gabbana campaign, and she became the face of the baby boomer generation because what advertisers realize is we have all these baby boomers, and we want to sell them stuff because they have free time, and they're the best buying, you know, they're the, the biggest consumer population in the States. And so she ended up just sort of being in the right place at the right time and becoming the face of that community from a product selling perspective. And so I was learning about how to sell products online. I said, hey, you know, we ought to, um, you were a makeup artist, you're now this fashion model, why don't we create a product? And her first response was like, dude, we don't need another tube of lipstick, like we just don't. And then we kind of got to talking to all, the, you know, because we were best friends and I was 18 and she was 55. And so we got to talking about all these viewpoints that we had on age and all this stuff. And then it sort of spawned out of 
messaging rather than products. But now what I do is I find a face for my stores. I don't be the face of my, I mean, I was the face of those stores I showed you the pictures of, but if you want to have, um, it's good to have a, I don't remember your question, honestly, but it's good to have a, <laughs> it's good to have a face behind your brand, you know, someone or some, a couple people who are, I don't know, what'd you ask me, man? Yeah, I answered it. Oh, was she a celebrity? Yeah, she yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> I've just got to say, you're a friggin' freak. I just <laughs> never I'm, come across a guy like you. I'm happy about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, That's um, all? That's all you got? No, no, no. <laughs> what about Aussie with, with um, <laughs> shopping carts? Big commerce. Shopify.au, uh, Magento, Yahoo works great over here. Yeah. I mean, uh, Australia, you guys don't really have. Um, the problem of, of platforms not working for you. Yeah. Now also, image rights, you, you were talking about protecting the, get, buying the image rights, how do you do that? What, what I just meant by that was that, so question is, uh, sorry, I need to be repeating these questions. Um, what do I mean about image rights? Yeah. What I mean is Google, you know, if you go to Google and you click on Google Images and you put in the URL of an image, yes. it'll pull up all the ones that are the exact same image. Yes. So they know if your image, like Google now can index images and see which ones are the same. So you want to make sure your images, even if they're the drop shippers images, you take them, you clear out all the metadata of that yep. image, you increase the size and you watermark it. And now your image is unique to your store. And now you've got a leg up because what Google's looking at when you have 15 dropship stores is which are the richer pages, who has unique images, who has more content because everyone has a similar amount of the same ki yeah. type of content. And what we do now is once our stores get successful, we actually buy the products ourselves take pictures of them and then resell them. So we have our own unique pictures for our stores, but that's what I mean by image rights. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have an education company that sells quite high priced educational courses. Our average sale value is 1050. Um, so thinking about the Facebook tra traffic, have you run successful campaigns to higher priced products from Facebook? And it, might, it might be part of a thing for Vic as well, yeah. but Doctor. like because it's education in, in uh, as a whole, would you go for like a broad lead gen capture thing and then funnel it through or are you kind of going very specific with the niches? So the question is how is Facebook relevant for high, high ticket items? Well, again, our goal with Facebook is not to sell, it's to engage a community. That's all we want to do is get people to see us all the time, watch our videos. Does Facebook work for selling high ticket items? Yeah. How would I do it? I would identify my best selling product and I'd create a video, I'd create content based around that particular need and I, would I wouldn't go for the hard sell. I'd go for engaging people and generating a lead and then putting them up. It's more of an informational style sales funnel. It's not really a physical product sales funnel. It's not like a one and done purchase. It's not like they watch your video about how to felt an Easter egg and they go and buy the, the felt and the needle and all that stuff. It's more of a, a long form sales funnel. Like the, I, I used to run a um, company that sold real estate in Latin America and we were selling one hundred and two hundred thousand dollar lots and our sales cycle was a year long. We had to generate the lead. We had to do a bunch of educational calls. We had to get them on a phone. We had to bring them down to Uruguay to look at the product. Like the sales funnel was it's the longest sales funnel I've ever dealt with. And what you're talking about for a $1,000 purchase is a longer sales funnel. And so what I would do is engage them, get the lead, put them through a longer sales funnel, then make the offer. You'll have better success. Thank you. She's dying to give you the tissue, don't you? Yeah. Straight on the video. Thank you very much. Two questions, Ezra. First one, um, how much time and resources did you spend on building out a website? So say you decided, you've done your research, go, you know what, we're going to have a crack at selling bar stools. Do you do a light touch website for your bar stools or do you build it all out with all the content and everything and then put it up there? Or So how much time and resources do I spend on building out a, a website? Yeah. So I now have templates. To test the product, yeah. So I have, I have a template, like for this launch, what I did was I, I, I took that template that I showed you that cost me who knows how much to create. I paid a company 10 grand to skin it onto big commerce, to take that whole template and skin it over to big commerce so you can now upload it as a, as a big commerce template. And I'm now selling it as part of this launch. But I have these templates, so it's super easy for me to throw the website up. Usually, I've gone through my market criteria checklist. I've done enough research ahead of time to kind of know that it's gonna, 
work, it's either going to, like, I kind of know pretty well whether or not it's going to work. I do enough research ahead of time, but you never really know. But the beauty about an e-commerce store is what are you doing? You're uploading the products. You're rewriting the product descriptions. I won't rewrite the product descriptions before, I, before I've run some traffic, so I just put up normal product descriptions. I fill out the more information pages. You should watch that challenge, brownboxformula.com forward slash challenge. You can see how I do it, but I just throw up, a, I throw it up on a template. I put a little, enough information about us, more, whatever. It'll take you two days depending on how many SKUs you have. So yeah, I kind of throw it up quickly, but I throw it up quickly in a way that is optimized for conversion. I send AdWords traffic to it, and then I know. If it doesn't work out, scrap it, I'm on to the next. Okay. Um, the other question was, do you have a local team or an outsourced team? So obviously a lot of the testing you do is pretty dynamic. You know, yeah. if you want to test logos or yeah. double headers and that type of thing. So, so where, where is my team, and are they, do I have them locally or outsourced? So it depends on what the product is project is. So I have an in-house team. I got people in New York who work with me on a daily basis. I also have developers and designers in Europe and Pakistan. Like I have an outsourced team, but I also have an actual team in New York who works with me on a daily basis. I have both. It just depends on what, I, like people who are working closely with me, my development, like I don't know where Sam is, but uh, I've got a, one of my main developers who does most of my website developments in Europe but he does most of my projects. And his team is really my team. I mean, I'm employing these people, but they they also do out other work as well. So if you so. want to change things quickly, like if you want to move logos around or that style of thing. I've got a team in house to do that kind of stuff. But I, I don't usually, I mean like, I'm never really, on, I'm not really, uh, I don't, I find that working like this product launch and stuff, like all this just madness, I don't do well, I like to chill, you know. <laughs> It's work for me, you know? Uh, thank you. <laughs> hey, Ezra. Uh, thanks for speaking again. That was fantastic. Um, my question is around uh, building community around mm. your e-commerce sites. Um, exactly how are you doing that? Are, are you building forums on some of these sites? Are you, are you using Facebook as your community? It's, it's, it seems sure. like certain niche markets wouldn't really be appropriate for something like that as well. So are you just doing it on Boom by Cindy Joseph or across the board? How are we building community for our e-commerce stores? Two places. We have a blog where we have a video and we have comments. And we use the speak pipe and all this stuff you guys already know about. And we got a Facebook page. Those are the only two places people engage with us. On our Facebook page where we upload our videos and run our ads and we email our list and send them over to our blog. All the comments, all the community engagement is all happening on either our Facebook page or our blog. We don't use Twitter, we don't use any of these other ones. And, and you pick and choose which e-commerce e e sites that you're doing that for. You I don't do it across everyone. the board. You do it for your oddball ones too? Everyone. Okay. May not as, the frequency might not be as much, but I now see the value of engaging the community beyond just trying to sell them products. I think it's actually the, I think it, it feels better from a, just feels good to do that for the businesses, you know, to put a little bit more energy into them. I don't know. Yeah, I do it for all of them, but for the ones that are really humming, we do it a lot more. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, my question is just about... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. If anyone has a question, I want to know your name now. James. Hi, James. Hey. <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you go about finding and setting up dropshipping relationships? Is it as simple as contacting a supplier directly? Yeah. I wrote a 20-page report. Called, and I'm sorry to keep, I'm not plugging this product for you to buy it. I just, I created a bunch of content in the lead up to this product launch. That's good stuff, man. I wrote a report called Wholesale Only, which is how I get suppliers and get wholesale prices. 20 pages long. If you go to brownboxformula.com forward slash access, there's a little link that says Wholesale Only. You can download the report and, uh, and read it. But yes, you, essentially what you're doing is calling them up and saying, hey, I'd like to sell your products. And the interesting thing that's happening is that manufacturers and suppliers now understand the value of the internet and they understand the value of e-commerce sales. It was eight years ago, man, they wouldn't barely talk to you. Now they want you to sell their products. So they're not hard to, to track down. And, and my whole process, my phone scripts, all kinds of bad jokes are all in that report. Awesome. Should we read it, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. Hey Ezra, my name is Lisa. 
Hello, Lisa. You Liza. I know, I'm it's sorry. Lisa with a Z. Lisa. <laughs> yes. But it's spelled the same way Liza Minnelli spells her yes. name? Yes. That's what's confusing me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question <coughs> is in regards to shopping cart platform. Sure. So would you always use an <coughs> external platform like BigCommerce or Shopify, or if you use WordPress, for example, would you use like plugins like WooCommerce? Sure. Depends on how many SKUs you have. Mm -hmm. If you only have five SKUs, like on Boom, you don't need a big, uh, one of these big multi-product platforms like your big commerces or your Shopify's or your Bolusions. I stay far away from anything to do with WordPress when it comes to retailing physical products because WordPress is a platform that was not developed for e-commerce and they tried to shove these plugins on it, but it's, just not, it's a disaster in my opinion. I do not like it. I'm avidly against it. I'm not very strongly against many things. I'm against <laughs> WordPress e-commerce. Um, I don't like it. Uh, I, so it depends on what you're doing. If you are running a big box retail e-commerce store like the ones that I'm running in the dropship market with thousands of SKUs, you need a big commerce or a Shopify or a Magento or a ShopSite or a Volusion or a Zencart or one of these platforms that's built for that. If you're doing more of a branded, maybe white label product like Boom, that, that um, Boom, we have a couple products that are white labeled and a couple that we're manufacturing, but that, that we don't have a lot of SKUs. We're using a different cart because we don't need the features of one of these bigger stores. Right. So what cart would you use for something like that? Like 20 products, for example? 20? Um, yeah. Well, you might want an e-commerce platform for that, but any one of the, in your, your Nanocasts, your sh one shopping carts, your Infusions, your PDGs, any one of these carts that was set up for retailing singular items will work for that type of store because it's not based around the e-commerce, it's more based around the content, and there's one page that has lists of your products and it has add to cart buttons. They press add to cart, they move to the shopping cart. So the site is built not around the e-commerce functionality, whereas on these bigger box stores, the website is built around the e-commerce functionality. On Boom, our site is not built around our e-commerce functionality. It's built around the brand, around the information, the content. We also have e-commerce functionality, but that's not the point of the store. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Could you Thank you. Again? Which ones? The ones you just mentioned. Nanocar, that's the only one. Nanocast, that's the only one you need to know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, one shopping cart infusion, uh, sh uh, 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 Psydeck, uh, PDG, they're, I mean, they're all, it uh, just depends on what you're looking for. I got four minutes. Do you want to have questions for me? I got four minutes. <laughs> so this video? Yeah. I don't know. That's for shrambles to tell you. No, it's not. <laughs> no. I mean, maybe it will be at some point. He wants to know, how can he get what I just did on video? Fastwebformula.com. Fastwebformula.com, which by the way, if you're not already in there, dude, you need to get in there. What's going on? <laughs> uh, simple and just, you'd mentioned creating videos for keywords, and I wondered if you had a simple formula for creating those for the top three keywords. That was what you mentioned you were, you were doing. Yeah, well, we actually do them for most of our keywords, and we'll do, there's multiple types of videos, right? There's like unpackaging of the product. Hey, this is the product that you're about to buy, you know. For product-specific keywords, it's good to show them the product, and that's our favorite type for that, but you've got the, um, you know, the... the, the, are, the you, are you talking about creating like a YouTube video and putting tags in a description and going for a specific target keywords? Yes. When you say your top three keywords, you're exactly. talking about syndication? What, what we do is we'll create a YouTube, we'll create a video, either screen capture or face to camera or whatever. We'll upload it to YouTube. We'll put our keywords in it. We'll write our description. We'll put our, we'll upload the uh, transcript. We'll do to optimize the YouTube video the way you optimize YouTube videos, and then we'll do a press release to it. We'll build some links to it, and it ranks really quickly. We just rank YouTube videos so easily. I have a video right now ranking for anti-aging skin cream, number one or number four or something, and it gets a ton of traffic, make a bunch of sales. So just, we just find it really easy to rank YouTube videos. I already know his name, that's why he didn't say it. Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Um, <laughs> at the beginning, you stuck up that checklist that had points or whatever. Yeah. So what was the points? Download that at Brown Yeah, but Box what was the, oh, you're not gonna tell us what the, the cutoff was to go ahead or? It's ten, 10 to 20 and then 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 and 40 to 50. And it's got little happy faces and stuff. You, you can actually get the whole okay. checklist. 
uh, for, it's available for download. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's at fastwebformula. It's wherever the mem- Fast Web Formula Live. It's right there. You can right download there. it. I'm yeah. on it. I'm Thanks. There. Yeah, it's available right now. <laughs> hey, Ezra. I'm Tanya. Um, great presentation. Thanks for that. Um, just wondering, with e-commerce platforms, do you have a preference for SEO? Which one is best or is there anyone that's particularly bad? Yeah. Um, whoa, that was cool. I find that uh, it, it doesn't so much matter frankly, from an SEO perspective, uh, other than like if you have these platforms that generate these dynamic URLs with question marks and all kinds of crap, that is bad news. Don't want that. But any of the good ones, your big commerces, your Shopify's, your Belusions, your Yahoo's, your Magento's, all have static HTML uh, pages, and they all rank the same. Thanks. Yeah, it's not really about the platform from a ranking perspective. But if you want an answer, if you just need an answer, big commerce, because they let you uh, set the URL. Like you can take, if you're like transferring a store over to big commerce, you can, um, you can make the URL exactly what it was. Like you just have so much flexibility over URL structure on big commerce, you don't have that on any other platform. URL flexibility from a structure standpoint, big commerce is the most flexible. I got 40 seconds, man. Hi, Ezra. I'm Stephen. I like hey, your Stephen. podcast. I discovered Thanks, you through James. Awesome. Um, reputation management, when you talk about you're reselling those as services, um, are you talking about keeping a brand integrity or uh, you're building up a sort of a backlist of... You take a, what I'm talking about is like, for example, I work with a couple skin uh, supplement companies that are doing like $30 million a year. People hate these supplement companies, right? Or this rabbi guy who's like sleeping, who got banned from Israel for sleeping with all... Just, uh, these people who have these, who are, who, ha- who are figures or brands that are figures that people are looking for, and you have all these queries related to them, complaints and scams and all this stuff, and so when you put in one of those queries, all kinds of stuff shows up, and what I want to do is make the stuff that they want to show up, show up. And I only work with someone if I actually think they're, if they're, if they're bad people, I'm not going to clean up their reputation. But I use a very similar syndication model. But one of the things that I have m- other mediums that I use, about.me, crushpath, um, slideshare.net, all of these m- places, and I can give you my list of, of I, I've done a um, ranking frequency, so across all my reputation management clients, what social profiles, what uh, URLs, what blogs consistently rank, you know, your LinkedIn and your Twitters, whatever. Um, and so what, what we try to do is, is from a, a, a media format perspective, as well as from a um, channel perspective, take over the page. So if it's a branded name, they're gonna, we need a video, we need a press release, we need a bunch of social profiles, we need a blog, we need, you know, reputation. Good 40 seconds, thanks. Thanks, man. Okay, uh, that's it. We're done.